Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, minimum number of operations to make an array empty. We're given a zero index array of positive integers and we can basically do two operations. Let me blow up this example. So we can either remove two copies of a single element or we can either remove three copies of an element. So those are the only two operations. You might be wondering, what if we only have one copy of an element? Suppose it's five. How do we remove it? We can't. And in that case, to step back, our ultimate goal here is to remove elements such that we get rid of the entire array. And we want to know what's the minimum number of operations to do that. But if we can't do that, then we return negative one. So in this case, we can do it. We have to remove two copies of two, and then we remove two more copies of two. Then we remove two copies of four. Then we have three threes left over. If we remove two of them, then we're stuck with a single one. Don't want that. So we remove three at the same time. That was four operations. That's the result for this problem. It clearly becomes a game of taking every number and then mapping it to the count of that number. And the count is really the only thing that we're concerned with because we want to reduce the count for every single one of these down to zero. How do we do it though? I mean, obviously if we had an element with five copies of a number and let's say it takes uh, two operations to get that down to zero, we know that if we see another five, it's going to take two operations to get that down to zero too. So what my brain immediately went to was let's just look at what it takes. Like if we have one copy of an element, we can't get that down to zero. So let's just put a negative one there or something else. If we have two copies of an element to get that down to zero, it takes one operation. Same thing with three it takes one operation with four. Now we are not at the base cases. My brain immediately went to Fibonacci. So to get the minimum number of operations for four, we take one plus the minimum for counting four minus two and counting four minus three. And the reason I'm doing this is four minus two is obviously if we were to remove two from four. That's why I do the minus two. We can also choose to remove three from four. That would give us one copy of the element remaining. And then we'd go here. Now, that's also why I have the plus one here because we're doing one operation here. And then these are the sub problems. You might notice that we have a negative one here and that's always going to be the minimum. So if we do four minus two, we jump up here. If we do four minus three, we jump up here. So maybe it would have been better to put like infinity over here or something like that. But basically what I'm getting at is a dynamic programming slash memoization solution for this problem. Problem. And I actually did code up that solution because the way I am, if I find a solution that works and that is relatively efficient, like this one, where we will never have to solve the same sub problem twice. And basically the overall time complexity becomes big O of, I'm going to call it X. I will say the time complexity is N plus X. Let's say N is the size of the input array for every number and X is is going to be kind of the memoization thing that I talked about, where the number of times we might end up reducing a value is actually going to be the size of that element itself. If we had a really, really big element, it would take a lot of operations to reduce it. So that's kind of where I'm getting the time complexity from. And I thought this was good enough. So I actually coded it up. I won't show you, or at least I won't walk through the entire code for that. But I'll quickly show it to you here in case you're curious. So this is like the bulk of the code down here. We just use a counter in Python that basically just counts the occurrences of every single number and puts it into a hash map. Then I declare the result as zero. I iterate over those elements, the number and count of that number pair. And then we run our recursive function DFS. So this is the DFS. It's nothing crazy if you're familiar with like memoization. We do some caching to eliminate repeated work and we do that formula that I kind of talked about n minus two and n minus three and we do detect like invalid results and all that. And this technically works, but the solution to this problem is actually even more simple than that. If we take an extra second to look at the table here, we're counting the number of operations it would take to make this number zero. We can either remove a two or we can remove a three from each number. 
we get to a point where actually with twos and threes, we can literally create every single number greater than or equal to two. So the only case where we return negative one is if one of these elements only occurs a single time in the input array. And if you don't believe me, let me put it this way. We've clearly created all of these elements with two and three. By the time we get to five, five is two plus three. If we want to increment this by one, we take the two and increment it by one. Now we have three plus three. If we want to take an element that's made up of all threes and increment it by one, we take one of the threes and remove it and replace it with two twos because that's four, obviously, right? So we can clearly increment that by one. Now you tell me anytime we have a two and we wanna increment that by one, can't we just increment the two? Eight is just gonna be three plus two plus three, and we can go like this forever. You wanna increment this by one? Take one of the twos and increment it by one. You wanna increment this by one? Take one of the threes and replace it with two twos. So we can basically form every single number. Now the question is, how can we take a number like this and count how many operations it would take to make it zero? Well, this is kind of the part where you can think of it as being greedy. Of course, we want to use as many threes as possible. So anytime we have a number that is a product of three, then we can just take that and divide it by three. It's gonna take two operations or nine divided by three, it's gonna take three operations. But what if we get to the number that would have a remainder of one. For example, 10. It's gonna be three threes. Well, it's actually not. It's gonna be replacing one of the threes and replacing it with two twos. So it takes four elements to make it and to like basically reduce it down to zero. Okay, well, what about 11? Well, for 11, we would just take one of these twos and replace it with a three. So it still takes four elements for 11 as well. What about 12? Well, 12 is when we replace that final two with a three. And this also takes four elements. So what we kind of realize is you can take the number, divide it by three, and you get four numbers. That's correct. What about 11? 11 divided by three, you get three point something, 3.6 or whatever. If we take the ceiling of that, meaning we round it up, then we get the correct answer. So we just take 11 divided by three, we get four. Take 10 divided by three, round it up, you get four. So it works. So if you give me any number, and just to kind of prove it, if you gave me 100, I know that 3 times 33 is equal to 99. I know it takes 34 operations to make this zero because I know we can just replace one of these threes with two twos, and that's just one extra integer to reduce this to zero. So that's why it works. Now we can pretty much solve this problem with a lot less code. We can do so just by iterating over the input array and taking the count of each number, dividing it by three, that time complexity should be big O of n, where n is the size of the input. And since we are counting the occurrences of each number, we technically have big O of n memory as well. Let's code this up. So I'm going to count the occurrences of each character. I'm sure you know how to code that up. We could do like a for loop, iterate over this, increment the count of each number, but it's also pretty easy in Python just to call the counter, which does the exact same thing. So this will say count of every number is gonna be equal to the count of that, I'll say C. And then we can iterate over that hash map like this, N, C, this is the pair, in count.items, and let's declare our result as well. That's the minimum number of operations, and we want to out here return the result. Okay, now going through every single pair. First, we check, is the count equal to negative one? Because if any of these integers has a count of negative one, we gotta return negative one. Okay, it's, the count is not negative one, sorry, it's one. If any of these numbers occurs a single time, we cannot reduce it. So we return negative one in that case. If that's not the case though, we can take the result, add to it the count of this divided by three and round that up. So we take math dot ceiling and that should round it 
that's the entire code. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.